Welcome back, Chappelle. All right, so you guys did so great in class today, talking about the dying Valois family and the religious wars that were going on in France. Now, that's going to rip the country apart, but it's also going to install its first bourbon monarch, the man by the name of Henry IV, a.k.a. Henry the Great, right? So he is a Huguenot noble that is going to end up getting married into the Valois family, as we already know, uh, because we discussed the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. We discussed Catherine de Medici on the, uh, like, in class today. Talked about her really, really nefarious plot slash oops, I killed everybody kind of situation that occurred on St. Bartholomew's Day, right? So... But Henry, because he has married Margaret Valois, because he is now like next in line for the throne, because Charles IX is going to probably die with no kids, because he never had the ability to have any, he's going to be the one that inherits the throne. So he becomes Henry IV of France, right? And he is the very first Bourbon monarch, the same street that, or excuse me, the same family that the street is actually named after. Now, one of the biggest things that he does is he comes in and he converts to Catholicism. Why does he do this? Because he believes Paris is worth a mass, right? He's basically saying in a nutshell, I'm fine with converting to Catholicism because as long as I'm a strong Christian and a good leader, it'll be good for my people. And we also need to stop all this war that's going on, right? War broke out after the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre and really, 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 everything hit the fan, and it's going to lead to the death of several thousand people. And when I say several, I mean in the tens of thousands of people. Now, in the process, though, after he converts to the Catholicism, besides his famous phrase, a chicken in every pot, he actually also issues a document known as the Edict of Nantes, right? And the Edict of Nantes is very, very important because basically he says, yes, Catholicism is the official religion of France, but... No longer may Protestants be persecuted. They can work in the government and they're allowed to worship, right? So he basically is the very first monarch in France and in Europe altogether to open his doors to religious tolerance, right? Now, he is going to have a son, and after he dies, he is going to be nine years old when he takes over, right? Henry did a very, very good job being a king, led a very, very, very great area, and sent France into a time of prosperity, right? And his son is going to take over, and his son's name is Louis the Thirteenth, right? But since he was only nine years old when he took over, there's going to be a massive issue, right? A nine-year-old cannot be king. Well, he's king, but he can't make decisions. So who instead is going to rule for him until he gets to this age, right? He needs to be of legitimate age. The people that rule for him, because he was too young to rule, also because he was really soft, are going to be, like, because he only actually was ever in charge for, like, three years, right? And if you've ever seen uh, The Three Musketeers, right, The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas, but it's also been adapted by Disney and stuff like that, this is the king that is in that movie, right? That's Louis the Thirteenth. Hmm. But he's only going to rule for three years because he was just a very, very kind of, like, very soft ruler. He didn't have the ability to be tenacious and make bold decisions and be really aggressive and do what needed to be done for France. The only things he's really known for are his fashion sense. He like introduced long wigs to the court and like it became very popular in all of Europe for men to wear very big, fabulous wigs. He introduced the big cuffs and collars and he kind of just brought out these new fashion ideas. But other than that, these two people did everything for him, his queen regent and his chief minister, right? Because remember, he was nine years old when he took over. So he, there was no way he was actually ruling efficiently, right? And the queen regent is his mother, right? His mom. That's right, Margaret Valois, right? So Margaret Valois is going to rule mostly for him. She is going to make a lot of decisions. But then there's this guy, Cardinal Richelieu, right? These two actually ended up going into a small, not physical war with each other, but an ideological government war. This guy's going to end up winning, though, when he has her banished from Paris, right? And this right here is Cardinal Richelieu at the siege of La Rochelle. And as you can tell, just looking at the man, he's very intense. He's very foreboding. And why do you think, notice I said La Rochelle, La Rochelle, that's a French city. Why is he watching naval vessels and ships 
destroy a French city? Hmm, I wonder. Because Cardinal Richelieu was a very intense figure, right? He tried to destroy Huguenot nobles. He put spies in the noble courts to make sure nobody was going against his ideas or the ideas that he was giving to the king. And he led France, France, the French, in the Thirty Years' War because he despised the Habsburgs so much because of their long rivalry with the French, right? He is also the villain in the Three Musketeers movie by Alexander Dumas, right? Or the Three Musketeers book by Alexander Dumas. Now, Cardinal Richelieu is a very aggressive figure, right? He's going to kind of go back on the things Henry IV did with the Edict Nance. He's going to attack Huguenots. He's also going to support, like I said, he's going to support. But here's the other weird thing. He supported Protestants in the Thirty Years' War. And the Thirty Years' War is a war that lasted for 30 years from 1618 to 1648. And it ripped Europe apart, ripped Europe apart. To this day, I believe it is the most casualties per capita. I'd have to double check that, but a ridiculous number of people at the time died from war, disease, pestilence, and famine. Now, remember, Cardinal Richelieu was in charge because Louis was too young to rule. And then even when Louis grew up and could make decisions on his own, Cardinal Richelieu was still there, whispering in his ear, telling him what to do, da 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 Actually, when Cardinal Richelieu dies, which basically is like the king died, the king, Louis XIII, died only a few months later, right? So not even a full calendar year after him. So, but here's the thing. A lot of historians ask, well, why did Cardinal Richelieu have so much power? Why was he so aggressive? Why was he so intense? Why did he, why was he able to do all these things when he even ran the queen out of Paris? How was he able to do this stuff? Well, a lot of people believe it's because Louis XIII was focused on something else. A big problem Louis XIII was having was having a child, right? He was married to a woman named Anne of Austria. Now, this is why a lot of y'all believe and think in your mind that Louisiana is supposed to be Louis and Anna, and it's not. A and A means land of, all right? Anne of Austria is the wife of Louis XIII, okay? And the mother of someone else. But for a long period of time, Anne of Austria and Louis XIII could not have kids. They had multiple miscarriages, and they were really struggling, and they just could not seem to get pregnant and have it last, right? But then one day, they got one, and his name, look at this squishy little boy. All right, so now, like, this boy's name is Louis du Don. all right? So this person is the son of Louis XIII, the only surviving son of Louis XIII. Louis du Don. And what this means in French, du Don, is gift of God, right? So this dude's going to grow up super flipping arrogant, all right? Now, anyway, Louis du Don, all right, is going to be born to Louis XIII amidst the Thirty Years' War and also while Cardinal Richelieu is pretty much the guy in charge. Now, as he grows older, Louis is going to begin to observe a lot of things going on around him. He's going to witness the Thirty Years' War. He's going to also witness a large rebellion that happens. Because guess how old Louis was when he was crowned king? Louis XIII died when Louis, when Louis Dudon was only four. So Louis becomes Louis XIV at the age of four. All right, like look how tiny he is. He's so little. Now, also still into his legs. Now, anyway, but the big thing about it, Louis is going to witness a lot of crazy stuff. He's going to witness at a young age, right when he's about this age, um, this thing called the Fronde Rebellions, right? Which was a massive civil war that broke out in France of nobles trying to take power from the king because he was just a boy, right? So, and you're going to see a massive overthrow of certain institutions in France. And during this process, Louis is going to grow up, okay? Jot this down. Um, he was four when he took over, and he grew up to hate the nobility, right? Because they tried to kill him at one point. One time, apparently, Louis was in the palace, and a group of nobles stormed in there doing, during the Fronde rebellions, and Louis had to pretend like he was sleeping so they wouldn't kill him. They all came up to his bedside. They were like, all right, let's get on. And they just looked at him. He was sleeping, so they left him alone, right? So big thing, though, he grows up to despise nobility and decides that he is going to be the king over them, and he will become the light, for all of his people. And Louis the 14th was known as the Sun King, right? And a lot of like uh, historians argue why he picked this name, but most people believe he like believe most historians believe 
is because he believed that he was the light for all his people and he was the central focal point that everything in France revolved around, right? Like the solar system in, in and of itself. He is the, an absolute ruler at its absolute best. And the man, as you can see, was absolutely obsessed with his legs. Like, look at this, look at this. Going all the way back, look, gotta bust the leg out there, gotta pop a leg out. Oh wait, nope, nope, nope. Even when you got the four-year-old porch, you gotta pop a leg out, right? So like, he was obsessed with his legs because he was apparently a trained ballet dancer, right? And they were very strong and things like that. So Louis the Fourteenth, though, is also gonna grow up to be extremely aggressive as an absolute ruler. And he's gonna decide, since I hate the nobility so much, since I think they're such terrible people and all they wanna do is kill me when I was a kid, I'm gonna build my palace 13 miles outside of Paris. So remember when we talked about James the first, the Stuart, and how his idea of absolutism was, if you wanna to talk to me, you come to me in the palace, right? You come see me. Louis the 14th is gonna take that to a whole nother level. Louis the 14th is the seminal absolutist. He is the guy when you're discussing absolutism. And he is going to show off his absolutism when he builds his palace of Versailles. Look at the size of this thing. It's absolutely huge. All right, so the Palace of Versailles becomes the centralized area of the, uh, the entire French government, right? So, and it's 13 miles outside of Paris. So you can actually see that it's massive. The palace starts here, goes all the way down here, all the way over, all the way down, all the way over, all the way up, all the way over, and then also even extends forward right here. And also, really interesting thing, it's free for you to tour if you ever get a chance to go to Paris, as long as you're under the age of 18. But we're going to look at pictures of the Palace of Versailles and talk about the building itself um, in class tomorrow, okay? So we're going to discuss that stuff then. Now, big things, though, about the Palace of Versailles and about Louis himself is a lot of people ask, how was Louis able to gain so much power? How was he able to be the closest thing to a true absolutist that we've ever seen? Because a lot of historians argue that no, no absolutist was ever truly an absolutist because they were checked by some kind of royal authority. Mm. But big thing, though, about Louis is, first of all, he ruled from his house, right? And he also is going to limit noble power, right? He is going to rule completely from his home in his thing called his royal court, right? Which is a huge council of princes and nobles that carried out his policy and lived at his house with him. Versailles was so large, as I just showed you, over 300 noble families actually lived there with him. If you wanted to go play chess with a noble that you need, you know, you need to do business with, you'd be going to Versailles to go do that there, right? He even is going to create a new class of nobility, right? This is a very interesting little facet. So he actually had a type of noble that was there when he was born, right? When he was a child and when he was four years old, the sword nobility was the power in France, right? And the sword nobility were old military leaders, right? They were called the sword nobility because they were allowed to carry a sword with them whenever they went. Um, and that was like no one else in Paris or no one else in France was actually allowed to do that, right? So what Louis does to check their power, he creates a brand new type of noble, and they're called rogue nobles, right? The rogue nobles bought their way into becoming a noble, right? They were families that just happened to have enough money from this big middle class that was on the rise, right? Well, not huge, but a middle class that was growing, and they bought their way into the nobility, right? And there was a prerequisite that came along with buying your way into the nobility. It was basically that you were going to be Louis's lackey. You were going to be his sucker. You were going to be the guy that was always like, oh, King Louis, you're the best. I can't wait to go see your ballet performance. He would make hundreds of them come watch him do ballet. And they would just be like, oh, it's the best thing I've ever seen. I love it. I love it. I love it. Because they made him a noble, right? They made them nobles. Or he made them nobles. He allowed them to buy their way into it. They were his puppets, these rogue nobles, right? And look at all the hundreds of them that live at his home with him. And they were well known by the robes that they wore. Do you see all the robes they're wearing and stuff like that? That's a rogue noble. This is a sword noble, right? You can tell by the fact that he's carrying a sword. Now, big thing about this whole concept is that's where a lot of Louis' power is going to come from, right? A lot of his power is going to come from the fact that he created a place and a system to where everyone had to come up to him and it basically their power was contingent on him, right? So he actually had a very, very famous quote that a lot of people claim that he said. Now, historians argue this and he probably never actually said this and there's no actually like evidence that he did, but we don't care. We're going to tell the story anyway. But apparently the one time that Louis had to go down to Paris to talk to the Parlement of Paris was once and it was just to get them to like actually write something in a law and do what he was supposed to. 
or do what they were supposed to. And a noble was standing up at the front, a sword noble, and was looking at the king and saying, well, what about the affairs of the hungry? What about the affairs of the poor? What about the wars that we are in the middle of? Sir, what about the state? And then Louis turned and looked at me and said, I am the state! Like, so it just screamed it back at him, right? So big thing about this, I am the state. What a quote, right? What a quote. The big thing also, sorry if I hurt your ears. Uh, big thing about this I am the state quote is it perfectly personifies Louis's power, right? Even though he never actually said it, right? So like, even though he never actually said this, it perfectly personifies his power due to the fact that it shows us that he believed that he was the ultimate power. And after apparently, according to the same historian who wrote this in the 1830s, which is probably a big fat lie, um, apparently he never actually went back down to that parlement Mall ever again, right? He created authority. That's insane, right? He's also an uber Catholic, right? He is going to revoke the Edict of Nantes. He's going to destroy Huguenot not churches and schools, and he's going to try and force conversion, right? That's right. He took the document that his father or his grandfather wrote about, like, letting, uh, whatchamacallit, letting, uh, letting Protestants worship freely, tears it up, revokes the thing completely, right? This guy literally did whatever he wanted to do. I'm not kidding. This was his morning, every morning. Somebody would have, like, one of the biggest honors was helping him pick out his shirt. All right, so now also he's going to be able to pull this off due to the fact that he actually was able to make a tremendous amount of money, right? Now, so Louis XIV, obviously, as you can tell, was majorly into the colonizing game, right? Robert de La Salle is going to found the colony of New Orleans, and he is going to name the land that surrounds it Louisiana in the name of Louis XIV, right? And so he spends all that money he's making off these colonies, though, on his royal court and building the Palace of Versailles. And he thought he was allowed to do this, and he thought he had a lot more money than he actually did because he adopted this concept called mercantilism. Now, highlight that, star that, underline that. It's very important, okay? He exported more than he imported, and also the idea was gold is a finite thing, right? So the big thing about mercantilism is it's a fake economic belief that's not real, all right? So, like, it's not real. Monarchs at the time and absolutists adopted mercantilism because they believed that gold was a finite thing. Well, that gold is a finite thing, but they thought money was a finite thing, right? They thought there's only so much money in the world, so I need the most of it, right? So I want more than Mr. Mathern or Mr. Waterson, right? That's mercantilism. He's also going to increase tariffs, which is actually going to prevent people from buying foreign goods, right? So, like, the big thing about mercantilism, though, is it's not realistic. It's not real. It doesn't make any sense. Like, it doesn't make any sense because... What are you talking about, dude? Money? You can make money out of anything. It doesn't matter. Like, so it's just kind of a funny little thing that he adopted, and it made him believe that he had more money than he did. And so he would spend money on everything. And he spent so much of his life on wars. 33 years out of his 54-year reign in adulthood were spent on wars, right? He started so many wars. War of Spanish Secession. He is going to start, like, multiple other wars in, like, the French Wars of Religion. And, like, he dies with a tremendous amount of debt, right? for his sons and grandsons to inherit, right? Because his great-grandson is going to be the first person to take over after him because Louis XIV actually lived to be 70 years old, right? Like, so he lived for quite some time. He was the king of France for over 72 years, right? Like, so it's absolutely wild. And he ends up dying of a very, very, like, interesting little situation. You're going to ask me really quickly how he died in class, and I'll tell you then. But I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here so I don't take up too much more of your time. And when I see you tomorrow, we're going to start talking about this country. Dun, 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 dun. The Russians. All right, so, but I'll see you guys then. Y'all have a good one.